Hello, everyone, and welcome to Getting Back to Sleep as Soon as Possible for the On-Call Developer, or How to Win at On-Call. So let's get started. So who loves being on call? It's one of those painful duties we need to carry out in a global economy. I sleep around, you know, five hours per night under normal conditions, and still being on call is no picnic. It's stressful even if we solve the problem. You can't really go back to sleep after that. So let's talk about minimizing that specific pain and literally extending our life because that's what it's about, basically, uh, thanks to the reduced stress. So let's start with a couple of words about me. I was a consultant for over a decade. I worked at Sun, founded a couple of companies, wrote a couple of books. I wrote a lot of open source code and currently work as a developer advocate for Lightrun. My email and Twitter account are listed here, so feel free to write to me. I have a new blog that talks about debugging and production issues, which is pretty applicable for this specific talk at talktotheduck.dev. It would be great if you check it out and let me know what you think. Tom Granot is the guy that actually created and submitted this talk. I, I'm essentially filling in his shoes. So most of the stuff here was created by him. I just adapted it to my style. Uh, Tom is almost 20 years my junior and comes from an SRE background. I come from a developer background and am pretty old by now. So this presents a rather different set of experiences we both had. And I think this shows in the talk. That I think makes it a bit interesting. So let's begin. After we do on call for a while, we get into the habit of looking at every problem as a fresh problem. When a problem reaches us in this situation, it's usually a vetted problem that we actually need to solve. An engineer didn't solve it before or solved it and didn't document it. Real life isn't really pretty and things explode and collapse in ways we did not expect. How is real life different from that pretty bubble we try to live in? The DevOps on call know how to fix things created by, well, them, DevOps. Configuration problems, servers running amok, and other sort of fun stuff, uh, system stuff. Support engineers on call know how to fix application problems to some degree, as explained to them by the original developers and as the documentation states. The problem is that the environment we're in at uh, at in real life is, it's complex. We have changes going in all the time, support queries, networking issues, hardware failures, and coworkers messaging us off the hook. Sometimes being on call feels like an action movie uh, mechanic where you, you're on a plane trying to fix something while the bad guys are shooting at you and you're just hanging there. And it's not a very tenable situation normally. So for any problem that relates to anything remotely complex with the application logic, an on-call developer is called. And that's where usually we step in. Uh, since money is of the issue, uh, the service must operate at insane SLAs. Business guys come up with insane ways to charge more money all the time. And our teams push new code out the door all the time. Keeping up with the pace is hectic and nobody logs all the right things all the time. So things get messy and are even harder to keep track of. So let's take a quick step back and talk a bit about observability. Now, I'm going to commit the cardinal sin of reading out the content of this slide. Uh, but this is important, so bear with me on that. Observability can be defined as the ability to understand how your systems work on the inside without shipping new code. That last part, without shipping new code, that's key. Monitoring systems, so 
to do just that. They monitor your infrastructure and tell you what's going on. Observability is about much more than that. It's about the level of insight into our running systems that will save us from the need to redeploy. In a properly observable system, we can tell what's wrong with the system just by asking it. It used to be that I would take my car to the shop and tell the mechanic about uh, the weird noise I heard. Now I take my car to a mechanic who connects the car to a computer and it tells him everything he needs to know. My car is observable. And if you think about it, it's an amazing on-premise installation with a complex service contract. Pretty impressive. We need to aspire to that level of serviceability for anyone using our observable application. With our current app, our tools tell us some pretty amazing things already. Uh, we live in a golden age of observability. Back when I started, we used to walk to the machine and kick it to observe the sound of a failing hard drive. Now we have so many tools we can rely on when we're on call. We need to start asking questions and then choose the appropriate tools that can answer the questions. So how do you start uh, understand what is happening when inside the application? Well, you read timestamped logs to get an event log of sort of your application. If the app is sluggish or unresponsive, we have the IT metrics which indicate CPU, RAM, etc. Again, useful stuff. We can monitor application specific stuff with service metrics. The name changes from company to company, but these are things that are business adjacent actions that are specific to your application and how the app shows up for the user. For instance, how many failures of transactions, and I'm talking business trans transactions, not database transactions, or how many transactions overall, et cetera. How do you check how long a task inside an application takes to complete and how responsive the application is? You instrument and take a look at tracers. Uh, <clears throat> that show you, well, for lack of a better word, traces of your application that tell how long things take to perform. There are many such tools that can inspect things like endpoints that can surgically go inside and give us information about that endpoint. How do you check how the application itself feels? You can use a profiler to see how the memory tool looks like, what's taking up resources, etc. How can you go down a random application code path step-by-step -step in development time? Well, use a debugger to explore how the logic of that specific application actually looks like on the inside. Normally, this isn't as useful for on-call, but it can be useful when using production debuggers like Lightran, my employer. Finally, how do you know what happens when an exception or an error is actually thrown? Uh, you can use an exception monitoring tool uh, to get richer context when a problem occurs. So here's the interesting part. Let's take a step back for a second and assume you have a chaos game day at uh, work. These are events that are designed to simulate uh, various failures in your systems. In order to see how your stack and applications hold up if they potentially happen in real life. When running such events, there's usually a pre-assigned pre individual dubbed the master of disaster, a person whose sole job is to make your lives miserable. The really smart ones take pride in sending your system to the edge of their abilities by introducing failures that trigger things, your monitoring systems have a hard time or can't catch at all. If we were to enumerate all the possible failures, we will never be finished. Too many small edge cases and unforeseen circumstances, but we could try and categorize many of them into a set of issues that are rather difficult to test, monitor and or plan for. And when they happen, they tend to leave havoc in their path. This might help explain why we can't figure out what's going on in five minutes during on-call, 
why despite having so much tooling in place that supposedly should increase traceability, we still have a hard time explaining what's going on. So how do you check for incorrect application state? So resulting from programming errors. How do you know that someone wrote a feature that behaves incorrectly under some set conditions? This is practically impossible to detect using traditional monitoring. And it's safe to assume the tests didn't catch it as well, since the logic is somehow flawed. The DevOps people and the support engineers will have a hard time figuring out why the service is misbehaving in that way without jumping into the source code. How do you ask questions about code level quantitative data? Basically, anything that has to do with understanding the size of objects at runtime, how long a specific piece of code spends inside a method, basically anything that has to do with quantitative data in runtime. You have to instrument metrics originally. You can't do it in runtime unless you have a metric there already. It would be impossible to know that you're facing an imminent out of memory error because that specific data structure is exploding in size. You only discover these errors after the fact, and then it's too late. The data isn't there. You're not sure what exactly caused that out of memory error. You sort of stuck with that. How do you check for swallowed exceptions in runtime? You can block checking in code that has an empty uh, catch block, but inevitably some code will pass through the cracks. The nature of these exceptions is that they, well, they get swallowed. A specific action will fail despite the log, logs showing that it worked correctly. These are especially tricky where the logs for the rest of the process are not great. It's difficult to follow through a specific process and understand exactly what failed and where. How do you plan for what happens in the interactions of multiple components in real time? When two pieces of software supposedly confirming to a strict API end up not playing nicely due to circumstances outside of your control such as API changes, network timeouts, unexpected formats, etc. How do you understand unexpected code paths due to real-time behavior? Circuit breakers tripping, users coming in with unexpected request parameters or states. How do you ask your system more questions about these user-specific issues? This was recently demonstrated at GitHub where a user incorrectly logged into a different user account these things are incredibly hard to track. How do you ensure that the result of a specific execution is always the same regardless of race conditions? Static analysis can get you part of the way, but flaky tests that end up getting ignored are oftentimes races hiding in plain sight. How do you deal with the real effects of part of your code working in parallel, serving multiple customers on any given time? and how one service affects the other. Not all architectures can or should uh, be designed around microservices. And if you're running a monolith, one part can impact the other parts in ways you couldn't initially expect. Furthermore, the idea that our microservices uh, stand robustly and can handle concurrency is theoretical at best. In practice, I often find they have such problems, only they are much harder to debug due to the distributed polyglot uh, environment. The problem is we can't predict all of these possible outcomes, especially as our systems scale and the components we build need to exist and interact with each other and need to exist or act concurrently. So we have enough background. Let's jump into our company and look at a simulated, a simulated problem we have for an on-call. Let's talk about your company's on-call. I'm saying your company, even though I'm talking about an abstract concept. Pretty much every company we go to has the same basic on-call setup behind the scenes. So when I say your company, it's really our company or any company. We're all 
24-7 companies nowadays. Unless you manage the local corner shop, you have customers practically everywhere. We're all more or less the same in terms of our on-call work. There are obvious differences, but the core concepts are the same. Pretty much all major companies are tech companies by now. We all need to have a developer on call at all times. Having fast response to disaster can mean millions in lost revenue. We also need a DevOps person and possibly a couple of support engineers to serve as the first line of defense when responding to customers. There's also the network operations center team that's in charge of monitoring all the systems. I won't get too much into all of those roles and focus mostly on the developer role since that's the one I'm mostly familiar with. A certain subset of players are report reporting that purchases are not going through. They're trying to buy our product and the purchase doesn't go through for some reason. Items aren't credited to them. Support engineers don't see anything problematic for the specific user account and defer to ops. The DevOps guy looks at the metrics which show nothing. The logs show nothing. DevOps aren't really sure what's going on. The service is obviously malfunctioning and now it's time to wake up the support engineer. This is the stack for our sample company, but it could be the stack for your company. It's pretty standard and common all around. This is a microservice-based application. We have services for credit card processing, transactions, fraud, inventory, billing, and gateway. The DevOps engineers set up a monitoring stack for each one of those production services. So a credit service box would contain its own monitoring service and would run in its own container. All production services are containerized, replicated for each type of purchase to distribute the load. The monitoring stack uh, details container health. This is a common practice for microservices and not a bad idea overall. Whether that's the right decision isn't relevant at this point as we're talking about on call. At this point, it's pointless to debate architectural decisions. They're already made. We sometimes need to support problematic architectural choices or historic choices that were made long ago and we still can't get rid of. By the way, this monitoring stack is based on a GitHub repository from Stefan Prodan. I hope I didn't butcher his name. You can see the link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning it, this is that I want this scenario to be realistic. Demonstrating abstract concepts like this is always a challenge as the real world is too messy and requires too much context. Before we proceed, let's look at the project a bit. As I said, it's a microservice based project with several moving parts. We're using IntelliJ IDEA here for the project and Maven to build it. This is a standard Spring Boot J Hipster project. If you're familiar with that, pretty standard stuff. You can see on the left side, all the microservices we discussed in the architecture uh, slide. Let's move on to the demo part. We have an on-call in progress. The user experiencing the problem already went through support and DevOps, and they even got us the user ID, which is 24,085, 24085. That would come in handy. So the first step any on-call developer does is open the logging system and try to find the problem in the logs. Since we have the user ID, this becomes very easy. We can just type in 24085 into the filter, and then we can see the logs that are applicable to us. There are a few logs, not too many. They all look pretty decent. Everything finished as expected. There are no exceptions or errors to be seen. This is pretty bad. This literally gives us nothing. And unfortunately, this is all too common when dealing with production issues. Now, the right thing to do here is to file an issue right after this task is complete, 
with a request to open more logs. <coughs> Another option would be to change the log level and try to reproduce the issue. But right now, that isn't practical in the short term. So before we activate the user and start annoying him with, uh, can you try this or can you try that? We'll try to dig into the source code and try to find the issue. The log provided some names of source files that are applicable. I'll go over them backwards, which is a habit I picked up. Failures usually happen towards the end. So let's go over the files from the log entry one by one and try to guess where the failure occurred. Looking over the inventory resource, it doesn't seem to be problematic. It has the right logs I saw in the code and nothing special there. I can start digging deep into the validate transaction method, but I'd rather check the other entry points first. Transaction resource is the next class, and it's even simpler than inventory resource. The same is true for credit resource, but fraud resource is more interesting. At first, look at the, the uh, look, the class looks normal and, and good. But when we dig down, the problem seems pretty obvious. There is an auto-generated cache statement that some IDEs generate with no logging by default. The developer somehow left that in place and review somehow failed to pick it up. Sadly, these things happen. This points us right into the area of code we need to investigate, but we got lucky. Notice that we have a lot of logs here, but most of them are completely useless. We need a better way to track source level issues of this type, and it's not available here. This is really a demo of something that went wrong, even though we were able to find the problem. It took us too long. This was a simple, pretty simple app with a trivial bug, yet it's a tedious runaround to fix that trivial bug in that trivial app. In production, the situation is worse. Our apps are far more complex, and with multiple engineers pushing huge changes, bugs that are much harder to spot than this are bound to make it into production. So, there must be some way to account for all of these things that our tools don't tell us. How can we make sure that when we do an on-call, we don't need to dive through the code and go bug hunting at random locations? That is obviously an untenable situation, especially for larger systems. I think the best long-term solution is continuous observability. This is a rising field where we can effectively ask the installed server a question and get an instant response. This field has many facades, uh, but the one I work on is in many ways a reinvention of what we think of as a debugger for the cloud, for production environments. So Lightrun is my employer and they provide what is essentially a debugger for your production environment. Uh, you should check it out. Sorry for the plug, but it's really a cool product. We also use it to debug production servers in my other job at Codename One. You should check out the article in the Codename One blog. One of the reasons I'm mentioning this is that the next talk in this track is from Brandon Ferguson about non-breaking breakpoints, which you should totally stay tuned for that. That's also one of the features of Lightrun, but it takes it to a completely different direction and I think it's very interesting to hear what he has to say and later on to ask me how that's different. Uh, and please write to me if you have questions about that and check out Lightrun. So sorry about that uh, brief uh, notice from our sponsor. Uh, so now that, that we got that over, let's summarize the strategies we need to win at an on-call. So, the first thing, you, you need to like what you're doing. You need to love being, well, not necessarily on call, but love the job itself. And I know it's cliche, I know, but everyone has on call. It's a fact of life. It's not going away anytime soon. And there's no reason to fight it. If you build something that's now running in production, you need to own it 
but not just own it. Make it a part of you. I find interacting with the customers is painful only when you make it painful. I like my customers, even when they're sometimes difficult to deal with, even when they complain. They're basically the people that are using the stuff that I built. And if they, there aren't people who use the stuff that I built, then it's not worth building it. So I'm thankful even for the bad customers because they teach me how to improve our product probably the most. So I do support every day and do it a lot. People are sometimes surprised I have the patience for all of the cases I field every day. I get asked a lot how I'm able to keep my cool and give support to people who sometimes don't appreciate it. For me, it's a mix of many things like yoga, family that keep me grounded and everything. Uh, but ultimately, I love supporting other developers. Uh, developers are my people. That's why I work in develop development tools. I care about that field. And when they succeed, I feel part of their success. So if you can't feel that, then on call might not be for you. Or, or you ser seriously just need a vacation. That's also an important thing for most people. So the next thing is pr probably a more practical advice of get your tools ready. Be ready to answer the questions that other tools can't answer. Think to yourself, what type of things do you have in your disposal or inside your context that develop DevOps and support engineers don't? Are you better oriented on the latest changes in application logic? Do you have code level visibility they don't have? Bring your own tools as much as possible. Documentation is key here. Prepare documents, uh, also known as runbooks, with common things to check and how to check them. If you think uh, something that, that happened might happen again, prepare a document uh, with what you did for the next on call. Don't think it'll happen again. Document it anyway, because it probably will. The analogy I usually give my team is about dog poop. A friend once asked me why I pick up my dog's poop when no one is looking and the spot is sandy, so it's unlikely anyone will step there. I explained that dogs always take you to the same spots uh, to poop. If I don't pick it up, I will probably be the one guy who steps on it later. The same thing is true with uh, documentation. I often run into the same cases over and over. It happened to me more than once that I Googled a question and spent a while reading a very familiar answer, only to discover that I wrote the answer. Now, I'm old and senile, but no one can keep up with the amount of information we need to process every day, especially with the stuff your teammates are running into. So document everything in a searchable system. That's critical. Have a list of tools and terminal commands you can run fast to get a visibility that is granular to the specific problems you solved. When Tom was an SRE, he had a bash RC that had various levels of abstractions uh, for it that he would load before an on-call session. Specific Docker shortcuts, JQ shenanigans, and other things that provide instant visibility into the running application. I have many shell scripts that instantly send me into any machine and let me remotely tunnel into the database so I can quickly verify any issue I need. Anything you can automate beforehand becomes far too important, uh, far more important when dealing with a P1 issue. I used to work for a company that built flight simulators and we had around 15 fighter pilots um, who worked for the company, including the CEO. Every time we did something big, we had a huge debrief meeting where everything was discussed, not with the goal of casting blame, but rather with the goal of strengthening what worked and fixing what didn't. This is a core fighter pilot best practice. 
that I took with me to every job since. For on-call, this is absolutely crucial. Since an on-call process includes so many moving parts and happens so quick, it's like a motor car accident if you've ever been unlucky enough to have it. It's a surreal experience and later on, it replays a bit in slow motion, but it's not what actually happened. And you don't have a real memory unless you document everything from all directions, uh, right as it's fresh. Afterwards, you don't really remember it. So you're often left feeling unsure. How could I have handled it better? This is the case with on call. You later on remember it differently than what it actually was. The problem, even if the problem was solved, and especially if the problem was solved, that's just not good enough. We need to look at our successes and see how we can improve on them. Did we waste time looking in the wrong place? Did we miscommunicate with the customer? Could we have better phrased the questions to the customer? Could the escalation have been avoided altogether? These are the type of questions that we need to raise in post-mortem for everything, for every case, the successful cases especially, because those are the cases we often ignore and say, oh, it worked, let's move on. And these are the cases where you can improve the most because this is something that works and can succeed more. Cases that don't work, well, you already have a problem <laughs> there and you're already aware of that. So I'm less concerned about those actually. Now, the final part is know what you can know and know what questions you don't actually need to know how to answer. Sometimes an ops issue gets all the way up to the developer by mistake. Ask questions and be a part of the team. I can't stress enough how many times I went to companies as a consultant only to discover that two guys sitting side by side, literally, didn't bother to, enough to talk to each other. As a consultant, I made a lot of money just by talking to people, I don't know, and opening communication channels within the company. This is sometimes hard in a work from home environment, but we need to work as a team to succeed. And it's your task to be proactive on opening those communication channels. So a good example here is a bank that I worked with quite a few years back. I'll give that example a lot because it's so uh, stands out. Uh, there was a process that should have contractually uh, lasted for one second and took seven minutes to perform. Uh, my job literally as a consultant was to come there and fix that problem. And all I did was run a profiler. I mean, you pay my consulting fee, which are, is immense, just for me to run a profiler. And eventually I discover that two guys sitting literally one desk next to the other, each one Perform, uh, called a method that queried the table for the next guy for every line in the table from the other side, SQL tables. So literally both of them were running a full query on the entire table for every line of every one of their tables. It turned out to be seven minutes. Just making a simple cache <laughs> reduced that to seven seconds and that's, they could have saved a lot of money just by talking to each other. So know the other guys, both in your team, the other developers, and also know the SREs, the DevOps, all of the other guys that you work with and that are part of your team and learn to be as a team, both in terms of friendships, so you feel comfortable talking to them, but also in technical terms, don't do dailies that exclude the DevOps. You need them to be part of your vertical team because otherwise, when we get to the on-call, when we get to the deployment portion, things will fail and they will fail outside of your control and you won't know who to ask and it will be very hard to cross the line sometimes. So it's important to have a vertically integrated team for that to work. Now, while I, uh, please ask questions if you have them in the chat. 
and uh, I'll try to answer them in the time we have left. Uh, thanks for bearing me with me all the way here. I hope I did justice to Tom's presentation. And if I didn't, then it's his fault entirely. Uh, please feel free to write to me. Uh, also, please check out talktotheduck.dev where I talk about debugging in depth. Also, check out lightrun.com, which I think you guys will like a lot. And check out the next session, which is also supposed to be very interesting. I definitely am a big believer in non-breaking breakpoints, which will be discussed there. And I think if you haven't used that before, you should totally uh, check that out. And if you have any questions, my emails are listed here, and I'll be happy to help. So uh, thank you guys for the comments. Glad to hear that. If you have questions, feel free to write them. <laughs>